almost as fast as a speeding bullet, leaping waves at a single bound. It's a porpoise. It's a fighting, flying blue marlin. Half bird, half fish, it's the Elko PT boat with enough dynamite to blow up a battleship and the speed to get away if the first KO punch misses. They didn't happen as a little naval accident. MacArthur asked for 200 of them back in 1937 to defend the Philippines. He didn't get them because they weren't in existence even on paper at that time. But when in 39, Henry R. Sutman, executive vice president of Elko, was approached by Secretary of the Navy Charles Edison, he went to work. He remembered several hundred motor launches built by Elko for World War I. This was another day. They'd have to be new and better, the best. In 1940, the first squadron of PTs, numbered 10 to 17, was running deep sea tests for the Navy. Between Cuba and Florida, they hit the tail end of a hurricane, took a beating and stood up. Not one of these 70-footers was lost. The Navy asked for more of these seaworthy midget sluggers, and the British wanted some too. The need for heavier armament brought out our 77-foot PT, and this was the first to see action in the Pacific. One man, Irwin Chase, managing constructor of Elko, was the clearinghouse for all new ideas. For 40 years, a designer of small boats, both wars found him immersed in his specialty. The additional burden of combat specifications he took in stride. But before an idea can be embodied, it must have shape on paper, dimensions in minute fractions of an inch, proportions from every angle and description of material. Every single part must fit. The drafting room workers spent thousands of man hours on blueprints of everything from an 80-foot keel to a quarter-inch washer. They had the answers before a saw touched wood or a lathe turned metal. When the ideas had boiled down to a unit, this 80-footer was the PT giant killer that went to Guadalcanal, the Aleutians, Panama, Africa, Sicily, and the Channel ports. There were hundreds and hundreds more of them. How did they all get built? We know the men who fought in them, Bulkley, Kelly, Cox, the Expendables, but who made them? Where did they come from? Over the Bayonne, New Jersey plant of the Electric Boat Company, Elko, the E-flag presented by the United States government for excellence in war production has never been absent. Six times it has been given for ever-increasing efficiency. The people come to work. Coveralls are supplied by the company and company washed whenever soiled. No work-stained wretches leave the plant at the end of a shift at Elko. They can go straight to a movie if they've a mind. There are 19 buildings comprising the Elko plant, big ones housing several departments and smaller ones containing a single operation. Some are as new as this war, others antedate the First World War. Concrete roadways provide passage for heavy material on boats and wheels. An enormous boat launching crane stands by the dock. Long pipes fitted with blowers and worm drives form the sawdust trail. From every woodworking department, they carry highly inflammable sawdust and shavings to the incinerator to lessen the fire hazard. This is a ship shape factory. No piles of dust on the floors, no rubbish in the corners. There's a lot of stuff to be moved from building to building. The Elko locomotive, nicknamed Shifty, handles large items routed by rail over a system no bigger than an amusement park's miniature railroad. A train of torpedo tubes is on its way to storage. There they pile up until installation on nearly completed boats. Dummy torpedoes are used for size and weight, for you have to know what every PT will do with a full load. But many of the hundreds of thousands of pieces that go into a single boat are moved like this on small hand trucks. Fill them and roll them. There's more where they came from, more is needed where they go. In the storeroom, literally millions of parts are waiting. Aluminum bronze propellers are taken in threes, three to a boat. Every part must be inspected for the perfection demanded by the utmost in dependability. Exhaust pipes are racked, waiting for installation.
bronze struts to hold propeller shafts. It's a wooden boat, mahogany from Africa and Honduras, white oak from Jersey, Brazilian balsa, maple, fir, Burmese teak, West Coast cedar, Wisconsin birch, Alaska and Canadian spruce, ash, poplar, and heavy greenheart from the Guianas. A machine sizes and paints the strips of mahogany in a single operation. And the hand of the woodworking craftsman puts them to work. Hard mahogany from the Gold Coast of Africa is laminated with a phenolic resin glue process. Mahogany that won't split under the pounding of the sea. They shape the frames that will become the boat's ribs in a mold of standard form. When it's all tightly locked together, they carry mold and frame to the baking oven. New gluing techniques, able to withstand salt air and water, represent a great advance in the building of wooden boats. Glued members are actually much stronger than the original wood. When wood and glue have been baked at a temperature of 140 degrees, they are bound together as strongly as if they were welded steel. The frame will stay in the oven for two hours until the glue is as hard as the mahogany. Afterwards, the frame is sawed in two, making identical pieces. At this point, the many laminations can be seen easily. Planing rollers smooth the surfaces and bring the width down to the precise specifications. The girders, intended to carry tons of engine weight and fuel supply deep in the boat, are made differently. Each has two layers of hollowed mahogany, plywood between, and a plywood cover on either side. This makes for maximum strength with the least possible weight. Glue binds it under pressure. No heat is necessary. After staying in the press 14 hours, it's brought out. Rough edges where the glue hardened after being squeezed out are trimmed and smoothed. Wood and glue are made one in a single hard surface. Its measurements are as exact as those of bolt and nut. When lowered to the bilge of a PT, it will fit without additional planing. The surfaces are sanded. And finally, it's peppered with rivets binding tight from either side. Another inspection follows as a matter of course. No chances can be taken. When these and a few hundred other primary constructions have been completed, they are brought to the boat assembly floor in number 21 building. 20 boats in various stages of completion, four and six abreast, move gradually toward the far exit. Men and women swarm over and into them, nailing, tapping, riveting, gluing, fitting and painting. Carefully efficient methods and an infinite number of special skills carry the work forward. Parts which have been constructed elsewhere are now being brought together for final assembly. board is used in the fabrication of frames. Each form fits into its assigned place. When bolted together on the board, they are in the perfect alignment established for each particular frame. A completed PT takes 62 of them, each slightly differing from all others. With the frames assembled, all present and accounted for, the birth of another PT can be started. They are so light, despite their great lateral strength, that they can be handled by a couple of men. It's not unheard of for a woman to help carry a frame from screeve board to the jig. On the floor lies the wooden jig, establishing the proper place for each frame. Frame after frame is set in place. As the vessel begins to shape up, a surprising fact is obvious. Defying common laws of boat construction, it rests bottom side up. This Elko innovation permits easier assembly in the early stages and work on the hull from above rather than from a cramped position below. At intervals among the frames, seven watertight bulkheads are to be inserted. 
they divide the boat into sections with small watertight doors for passage. When the main bulkhead is put into the jig, it's set at a certain angle of declivity. All the other bulkheads and frames are then brought into an exactly parallel position. Once the angle of declivity has been established throughout, the first nails and screws are put in to keep them steady until other reinforcing parts have been added. The stern, or transom bulkhead, comes on last. The steam box is used to prepare wood for bending. Where the bottom meets the side, long, heavy pieces of white oak run the length of the boat. These are called chines. While still hot, moist and limber, they are put into a mold corresponding to the shape of the boat at any given point. Later, cooled out and dry, they retain the shape the mold has given them, but are still somewhat pliable. Here, as elsewhere in a wooden PT, there is a tough resilience not found in more rigid steel-hulled vessels. The backbone of any ship is the keel. In a PT, it's a massive molded 80 feet of bolted Sitka spruce. Two expert Scandinavian artists with the ads hew all the keels to a pencil line accuracy. 30 years on the job have given them the confidence and incredible skill necessary for this kind of work. One bad stroke could ruin the labor of days, but they never miss. Finished, the surface is as smooth as plain and sandpaper could achieve. At the bow, the keel is sharp as a knife edge. It's a long, unwieldy member like a spine without ribs. The PT still rests ignobly on its back, like a helpless beetle. Men climb and pound the keel into place. Next, the white oak chines and gunnels are set in place, marking the division of bottom and side, and side and deck. They are the boat's wide, flaring shoulders. Diagonal battens are fastened along the sides, a first binding of cartilage over the bare ribs. Inner planking crosses the battens on the other diagonal. The boat takes form as you watch. A heavy coating of glue is spread all over this planking. Then they stretch and tack on it yards and yards of the finest airplane cloth. Glue and cloth are bound together by ironing. Hand irons for sections within easy reach. Long handled irons when an arm is too short. The heat causes the glue to seep into cracks and impregnate the cloth. Already it would be impossible to spring a leak, but there is more to come. Another planking goes on the outside. This time the entire hull is nailed and riveted to eternity. You wonder how there's room for so many nails, rivets, and screws. They are brass, copper, monel, stainless steel, each best for its purpose. One PT boat requires over 400,000 of them. At noon, the Elko canteens provide a kind of food that heartens workers in essential war industry. A cafeteria ministers to the desires of sit-down eaters. Mr. Supman, the executive vice president, can be found there too with some of his fellow executives and visiting naval officers. An additional activity of the noon hour is apt to be a bond rally or morale building entertainment. But more vital to the factory's main job is another noon custom. The hull is now ready to be turned right side up. A different employee is given the honor of presiding at each turning, but the same crew of experts is always present. They chose the noon hour so that workers on the hull would not be delayed during the operation. The hull now weighs 12 tons, a weight that must be handled cautiously despite the toughness that has been built into it. It lifts and turns inch by inch. This is the first of many times a PT boat will take to the air. Another will be at the launching, and then still later when lifted aboard a ship to be transported oceans away. But most frequently, it will be when under its own power, leaping the waves. The hull sinks slowly into the steel cradle on wheels. This will be its resting place for the remainder of the trip, the length of the assembly room floor. It will roll out of the big door and on to another building for additional fittings, and finally, it will go out to the launching crane and slip away, waterborne, from infancy into its own element. Soon, the workers, back from lunch, are busy again, inside, topside, and outside. 
Deep in the hull, they are fitting girders into place. The hollow construction and comparatively small size enable a couple of men to handle them with ease. But they are still capable of performing the double function of supporting the major weights to be installed later and strengthening the hull bottom against stresses from that direction. When heavy seas and distant oceans apply their twisting, crushing force, these girders stand firm in the heart and bowels of the high-jumping PT. Their laminated strength is absolute insurance against any structural failure. Outside paint is sprayed on, marking the waterline. One kind of paint above and another below. There's still camouflage to come. On the deck, there are installations to be made before the decking arrives. Metal strengthening straps distribute the stresses and strains of the torpedo tube installation. Torpedo and tube, weighing close to two tons on a plunging PT, must be anchored deep in the boat's structure. At this time, the covering board is laid on the deck beams. There's always plywood arriving one minute and being used the next. Its advantage in many portions of the boat is greater strength and lightness. In many special constructions, Elko does its own lamination, as with girders. But standard plywood can also be used for less vital parts. The deck, for instance, is an Elko job. Two 80-foot strips must be glued from sheets of mahogany plywood scarfed together to make them strongest at the point of joining. Every inch of the surface is sanded. A crew of able-bodied men is required to move it to the assembly room. Reminds you of a zoo's attendants preparing to feed a reluctant python. Once aboard the PT, however, the deck lies down quiet as a rug. A few thousand screws keep it there. The joiner shop, another of the many woodworking sections of the plant, sees the construction of major sub-assemblies. Most of the superstructure of the boat comes out of this shop ready for its final fitting. A cabin trunk is being put together. Whether in the endless cold winds of the Aleutians or the sudden tropic storms of the South Pacific, it must be snug. And snug it is. No leaks, no holes, no errors. The chart house is also constructed here. Soon it will be moved to a flat top PT on the assembly floor. The sheets of veneer around a machine gun turret are protection against wind and wave. Bullets are another question, but they have to catch you first. A PT is as hard to hit as its fast-moving wooden sister of the air, a mosquito bomber. The installation of turrets and deck houses is delicate work. The clearances have to be like those of a piston in the cylinder. That's where the woodworkers of the joiner shop and those who brought the hull and deck openings to precise measurements join in Elko teamwork. Wood fibers from opposite ends of the earth have been shaped to a strange transfiguration in an American factory. Elko does not pretend to be a steel mill or an iron foundry, but many of the purposeful alterations of unshaped material take place in our metal shop. We bend the sheets of metal, we hammer them into place. There's grinding to be done and pipes must be bent. A hundred routine changes are made for the special uses of this intricately fitted boat. There's also welding, not up to the massive fusions of a Brooklyn Navy Yard, but enough to make the parts hold tight come hell exploding shell or high water. And a girl welder with her dark glasses and blue flame is doing what used to be a man's job. Almost a ton of cover goes onto a single boat. The main item is protective paint, zinc chromate. At one side of the vast million dollar war constructed assembly room is the machine shop. Here rough castings are ground, machined, polished, threaded and shaped to precision measurements. A turret lathe is rarely idle. Performing several operations with a mere shift of the tool in use, it's a jack of all trades in turning metal to variable uses. The magnetic chuck surface grinder holds its object with electrical force. Small parts must also be plain smooth. A 
A propeller shaft has to be tapered with an accuracy no human hand could achieve. And it must lie straight and true. Now they drill a hole in the tight hull. Three propeller shafts have to come out in the open. And struts must be attached to keep the whirling shafts secure as they whip up a monstrous wake that will spring together, dash high, and boil away behind. A PT's nervous system, the electrical wiring, connects engine room, chart house, day room, galley, and torpedoes to a central board. These assemblies are wired in advance and installed when complete. The Packard Marine engine is hauled out of the crate. As you might suspect, looking at its small size in relation to great power, there is aviation as well as marine history behind it. A distant ancestor was the Liberty Motor of World War I. More recent forebears were power plants of the Miss America racing boats. On a basis of pound per unit of horsepower, it compares favorably with the great airplane engines currently in use. It's built for maximum power, minimum weight, and bulldog endurance, exactly like each tough fighter boat that houses three of them. Brought to the assembly floor on dollies, they are carefully installed in a PT engine room. There's just enough room for them to line up. The two on the outside have V-drives, reversing the direction of crankshafts facing forward. The middle one has a direct drive to the propeller. It's a very compact engine room, but big enough for a competent engineer to make adjustments and repairs if they should ever be necessary. At full speed, the engines make a noise that discourages conversation. But engineers are less dependent on small talk than those who sing cowboy ditties on deck. And now the PT, with engines, superstructure, and deck aboard, is ready for its first run in the open, a 220 crawl on dry land. The big doors are open, and the boat is pulled outside. It's moved very slowly, because there's not too much space for maneuvers. Besides, any boat on wheels is not really at home. But there will never be a better chance to fall in love with the sharp-lifted bow, the long descending sweep of the chines, and the bulbous flare of the gunnels. Notice the convexity of the air and water riding bottom, and the beautifully curving lines that run from stem to stern. There's class all over her. You can see it in the outer shape. You know it's been built with infinite care. It's a proud boat and purposeful. You see it. The men who made her feel it. In the number 16 building, smaller pieces are added. Propellers are put in place, trued up exactly to avoid vibration. Three rudders, generating plant, batteries and wiring are installed. The ventilating system is completed. Firefighting equipment is put aboard. Preparations for placing armament are made. And don't forget those gas tanks. Powerful engines need plenty of gasoline. The three big tanks of a PT are carried amidship under the day room. The fact that a PT in action rides on top of the water exposes the tanks to enemy gunfire despite their position in the bilge. This leads to another parallel with airplanes. The tanks are self-sealing so that a bullet passing through is only another hole without a leak. Now she's ready to make her final move on dry land. As one boat comes out of the 16 building on the way to the water, another takes its place. At top production, no space can be left idle. They pass each other at the door, the arrival going in stem first and the other being hauled out backwards. The momentary indignity of backing into the launching crane is soon past. Days and nights of glory are in the offing. A giant dockside crane lifts the boat and its cradle into the air. Powerful machinery tightens under the dead weight of tons. The boat is moved out high over the water of the basin. Gradually, it's lowered until at long last, the boat floats free of the deep sunk 11 and a half ton cradle. A creature born for the water has come into her own element. She rests there, passive, at home, but not yet ready to live. A small launch pulls her away from crane cables and into the roofed, walled wet basin. The still powerless PT moves quietly behind. Final fittings are made in the wet basin. 
guardrails that prevent a gun from shooting away its own deck house or mast are put in place. Guns are installed here, and so is other equipment too secret to be mentioned. Guns forward, aft, in the turret, they sprout all over, and each must be installed with ultimate precision. For these are no toys, no games, no playthings. They are literally a matter of life and death. And how does she take all this new equipment? Will she carry it lightly? Will she ride high, fast, and handsome as ever? These are questions that must be answered without any lingering doubt. But the time has come when the engines will sound alive, alternately muttering and roaring their response to a throttle shoved forward with the heel of a hand. The first trial is to be run. They're ready to prove that she can do the main and simple things for which she has been built. She'll handle in the water, she'll run fast and run slow. But first she moves out slowly, leaving the wet basin. First, she's brought to the main basin. The engines are started up for dock trials. After an hour, they're ready. Instruments and triplicates show their delivery. The engineer throws his levers, meshing power to the propellers. And the shaft turns slowly. This, the builder's first trial run, is one of many. When the builder has been wholly satisfied, the Navy will take charge and try it all over again. Newark Bay sees the new boats come out week after week. At first, they crawl through waterways too crowded for racing speed. And now they change their pace. They slide easily under the high arch of the Bayonne Bridge. After crossing New York Harbor, they speed up the East River. All's well below. Shove the throttles a little more. Swing around that barge. That's the Hellgate Bridge we just passed. And out in Long Island Sound, she begins to run, warming up for the measured mile. Her speed is clocked. With stopwatches, calculations are made. and always the telltale instrument panel. Managing constructor Erwin Chase comes along to see his blueprints in action. Armament needs testing too. Keep that airplane high. Or maybe there's a submarine astern. Those shots are only testing, but they could mean business. They call them sea hornets, devil boats, and green dragons. They can turn on a dime, lean into a curve, or jump the waves like a jackrabbit. Their best work is done at night, so there's not much photographic record of their world-famous exploits. These are the babies Commander Buckley used to carry MacArthur out of the Philippines. They fought out of Tulagi, at Guadalcanal, at Sicily and Salerno, on the shores of New Guinea in the dirty weather of the Aleutians, and they helped guard the Panama Canal. They fought e-boats and were out in front of the invasion. They came back to the Philippines at Leyte. They're the little PT boat with a load of dynamite on either shoulder and they'll tackle anything that floats. They represent the newest combat weapon produced by this war and they have been expertly used by our Navy. The story of the PTs would be incomplete without a well-deserved tribute to the brave men who fight them. Like every man of war, the PTs were made for only one purpose to meet the enemy and destroy him wherever he can be found, be it on or under the sea, on the land, or in the air. The PT men have done just that, from barge to battleship, submarine to airplane. The PT men have acquitted themselves with honor, reflecting the highest credit upon the United States Naval Service.